So yeah, welcome. We um, just as a reminder to everyone, this um, for the folks who've been on retreat this weekend, this is also our normal Sunday sitting time. And so folks are coming in for uh, that normal weekly offering. And for the folks who are just coming in for the Sunday sitting, the reminder that you're basically joining the final talk of our weekend retreat, um, which is also really the kind of the final talk of our month long program um, of intensive uh, Dhamma practice, uh, clarifying the mind, looking at the four foundations of mindfulness. So we've spent a, a weekend on each of the four foundations. And so we're finishing up this weekend. We still have some days this week where people will be on self-retreat and we'll be kind of supporting them in that, uh, that process. But it's really wonderful to have a big group here for the closing of this time, but also just reminding ourselves that nothing has ended or begun or just going on <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be back next Sunday uh, hopefully if all goes according to plan nothing goes according to plan <laughs> no. Hmm. So, I've um, been remembering over the last few days a um, some literature I had been reading earlier in the year. Um, about folks who were studying ancient sites in the in Peru in the Incan Empire, and a, a phenomenon that they described as archaeologists, but really was a, uh, an important conceptual um, reality and dynamic in those ancient times. And not just there, but in a lot of places in, in um, ancient cultures and in contemporary cultures. They were describing a place where the river coming down from the mountains um, started to meet and be broken off by humans to create um, irrigation and terraces and agricultural use and um, use for cities and towns and human need. And so of course that's, you know, the, the Incas were famous for their terraces and just these incredibly sophisticated aqueducts and um, irrigation methods, but here in Hawaii, very similar, you know, these places where the, the rivers will start to get branched off um, into um, taro cultivation, um, terraces with, you know, very sophisticated uh, mechanisms of distribution and timing. And um, you'll find it all over the acequias and um, this, this place that was considered a sacred place of where nature meets culture, right? Where the natural flow of the stream meets the human activity that manages it, that utilizes it, that enhances it in certain ways for its own interests and development. And that then and now it's, it's recognized as just very powerful place where nature meets culture. So dynamic and so fraught with tension and possibility and um, the good and the bad of, of everything. 
I think sometimes it's easier to look at ancient culture or traditional cultures to see these places that are very visceral and obvious. Sometimes in modern culture, it's a little harder to see where do these things take place and what are the forces that impact them. I was just reading something about, they've made some advancement on um, uh, cold fusion, nuclear fusion. I don't really understand anything about it, right? But this idea that you could end up being able to generate lots of energy um, without all the radioactive waste of uh, nuclear fission that we use now and all the nuclear reactors and stuff like that. So there's a lot of um, people very invested in that and clean energy or whatever. And uh, I, it, I hadn't occurred to me, of course, until this article was like, and 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 we're going to be able to make some great weapons with um, with this, you know, when it comes out. It's like we're gonna we'll solve all of the world's power needs and it's gonna be a breeze. You know, we will no longer be this extractive force and there's just gonna be just like some really great bombs, you know, that get made. And so this tension of of what is the what is the nature of that moment where of where nature meets culture? what is impacting, influencing, determining the direction that that takes. And I think it's very powerful to, to recognize the way in which this practice is, is ultimately about that. And, and in incredibly literal ways, actually, that um, if you look at uh, Steve was describing a, a definition for dhammas. When you talk about dhamma nupasana, one definition is nature, natures. And when you look at the word bhavana, the meditation practice, the, all of these methods that we have, the one translation of bhavana is culture, a common translation of it. So this idea of where nature meets culture is very much mirrored in our practice, which is where dhammas meet bhavana, right? Where the unfolding of nature, of all this natural phenomena, and and the profundity of that, really, when we come to look at it, you know, we we you think of this image of a stream coming down and and meeting the branches of uh, the terraces, right? These ancient agricultural fields, that that experience of of dhammas of nature coming down, bearing down upon this moment, flooding through this moment, relentlessly, you know, this torrent of experience out of our control, the natural forces at play, coming down in this moment. And that from there, it is meeting the, the, the mind culture that we have and moving forward from there. Everything about what happens from that moment is determined by our mind culture, our bhavana, and how powerful that is, and how challenging that is, how humbling it is, and how much potential is there. What is it that's determining the mind culture where we move? We have the option <laughs> from creating beauty and kindness and care and wisdom and generosity, patience, right? All of these beautiful qualities that can come out, that can be the dominant force of mind culture. And we also have fear, hatred, craving, destruction, anger, resentment, spite, ill will, greed. The 
power of these as the potential for our, our dominant heart culture, mind culture, in the face of this moment where the Dhamma and Bhavana are meeting. And so how much is at stake in that and how much is possible in that? And so what we come to see, which is so amazing, <laughs> is that the bhavana, the mind culture, the mind cultivation is dependent very much on, on, on one hand, on some discipline around ethics and around um, morality, on um, carefulness with conduct, on effort, restraint and positive effort. But in terms of this flow from Dhamma to Bhavana, the, the, the de main deciding factor between whether our, we have wholesome Bhavana, wholesome mind culture or unwholesome mind culture is actually the ability to investigate the Dhammas, right? To understand the nature of nature and our ability to really do this Vipassana practice that we've been doing in all the ways we've been doing it. it. Our ability to investigate these dhammas, to understand nature has everything to do with the culture that gets created moving forward. And so that's what our practice is so much of, right? Is this trying to understand the nature of nature, the, the nature of these phenomena that are bombarding us moment by moment. And so, you know, as we've spoken of this understanding that fundamentally they, they have the nature of um, being impermanent, of being undependable or unsatisfactory, um, of being coreless in terms of self, right? No um, inherent self in them. That everything about their being is changeable, subject to conditions, unstable, undependable. That that is the nature of nature. That is the nature of these phenomena that we're trying to observe and trying to see how, of course, then there's an incredible vulnerability that is befalling us <laughs> in the moment. The instability of nature, the instability of, of all of the, and when I say nature, it's important to remember, it's not like a conceptual thing. It's just like seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, mind, right? The nature that we can experience, all of it, this relentless bombardment of changing phenomena out of our control as it's, as it's unfolding. And then everything that happens outside afterwards is our responsibility. So we have, so as the present moment is this coming together, this confluence, this point of sacred point of connection between nature and culture, between Dhamma and Bhavana, it's also this sacred point between vulnerability and responsibility. The, the purest vulnerability of everything happening outside of our control, even if there were things that we may have been responsible for in terms of however you wanna hold the notion of kama, karma, even if it's the previous moment, you can see that, oh, you know, we know, we were mindless and so we stubbed our toe and now we're receiving this moment of experience. The point is, is we may have had responsibility in the past, but in this moment, we're totally vulnerable to it. There's nothing that can be done about what's happening right now. Zero, right? There's zero ability to control it. And then there's 100% responsibility for what happens next. and how intense it is that we live at that point. But that is, the, that's the nature of the present moment, right? Totally vulnerable, totally responsible. And how intense that is. 
of course, why it's very hard to do this practice, why it's so hard to sit and meditate and try to train the mind, even on the most mundane of our vulnerable realities, right? Of watching the breath or, you know, watching something that's, uh, we try to find something basically neutral. Even that is so hard. Never mind all of the things that are truly painful or the loss of all the things that are truly pleasant or just the uncontrollability of it all, the overwhelm. And yet, whether we attend to it or not, we hold this deep responsibility for whatever actions we take now moving forward. How do we transition from being the inheritors to those responsible for those next acts of giving, of moving forward, of uh, creation and of, of our place in the flow of the stream in our lives and in the world. We have, you know, the, the path laid out by the Buddha as the eightfold path of right view, right resolve, right speech, right conduct, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Also, sort of on that side of things of these frameworks, you know, we've shared of, of sila, samadhi, and panya, right, of uh, ethical conduct of concentration and of wisdom, or of dana, sila, bhavana, generosity, ethical conduct, and mind cultivation, right? This idea of this is the way forward, right? This is the way to bear full responsibility for what happens next, for what we do with this flood of experience, what the culture we create internally and externally. And then, of course, on the, the other side, we have all of the negative ones that we know in our hearts and in our bodies and our minds. And, and of course, know through study of you know, greed, hatred, and delusion, the uh, hindrances of sense desire, of ill will, of sloth and torpor, of restlessness and worry, of doubt. all of it hinging on our ability to observe carefully what's happening, to understand the nature of this phenomena, right? Because when we understand things as, as impermanent and conditioned, uh, out of our control, not coreless, right? That these, these streams of sense experience that we tend to fabricate into a self really are individual streams that we can observe in their individual uh, ways. Then we come to peace with it, with the anxiety around being able, needing to control, the anxiety around pleasure, pain, and neutral, um, the anxiety, the fear, the longing. These things start to dissipate, right? The more we're able to see, the more we don't have the expectation that we can keep satisfactory experience going, or that anything is going to ultimately be satisfactory, or that we're ultimately going to be able to avoid unpleasant sensation. So much of the value of that Vedana Nupasana that we practiced last weekend of understanding pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, feeling tone, quality, heart quality, mind quality in response to each experience in the body, mind, or sense, sense doors. So the mind gets sharpened, gets softened, gets tempered by nature if we bring it into this kind of right relationship with it and have the possibility of then unfolding this good path, 
but it's also to be careful of like, you know, this good path is not avoiding all of these other things. It's not just a matter of discipline, right? It's not just a matter of shutting the door on ill will or shutting the door on sense desire or shutting the door on uh, ignorance or delusion. Sometimes we talk about the middle path as the path of non-extremes, the Buddha talked about it as the middle path. But there's also a sense of it's the middle path and that it goes straight through, right? It goes right down the middle of our experience. So there is no avoiding anger. There's no avoiding wanting. There's no avoiding delusion, misunderstanding, misperception, and all of the ways that the heart scrambles to try to find solidity and safety and security through these less wholesome actions and activities. The way to all of the beautiful qualities is through the hard qualities, through the unskillful qualities, understanding them. Really understanding that the vulnerability that we are subject to in life without the tools of mindfulness, without the tools of concentration, without the tools of, and the support of well-developed maybe generosity or patience or loving kindness or faith, that of course the mind falls back on unskillful tools in its desperation for security its desperation for stability, for comfort, for safety, right? The wildness of the stream that we inherit, it makes all of these very difficult responses of the heart and mind, ones that we know can cause harm to ourselves or to others it also makes them understandable, right? We see why, because it's so hard to see clearly. It's so hard to truly accept and and fathom loss. Truly so difficult to accept pain, harm, betrayal, what have you. So the mind agonizes, the heart agonizes in its way. And and in doing so, of course, finds some sense, some semblance of solidity in that agony or in the anger or in the wanting or in the fantasy. Because the mind is incredible in its ability to keep reproducing something. It's hard to keep reproducing a physical experience. You can do it, of course, we all do and try. But the mind is very sophisticated and adept at reconjuring experience that feels stable, that feels secure, that feels safe. Um, So all of these views we have, right? Our opinions, our ideas, our views of ourselves, our views of others, our opinions about the world, whatever. It's like, yes, these are very solid feeling things until we explore them, right? Until we start to have this tool of chitta nupassana, of watching the mind, which actually was last weekend, not vedana nupassana, two weekends ago. And seeing that it's, mind is actually momentary. Mind is not solid. Mind is not this pervasive phenomena. Mind is coming and going just like anything else. It's just as unstable, just as undependable, as unsatisfactory, and actually just as coreless as anything else. And so we see also the exhaustion that comes from constantly trying to live in fantasy, constantly trying to reestablish ourselves, reestablish our views, our opinions. The mind culture that gets created in that It was very painful, even when we're right. Mm. 
and yet we keep doing it. That's sort of the, the kind of ironic part as yogis and people on this path is we see it, you know, we can see these glimpses of like, oh my God, the mind is just so nuts. And I just, you see the mind doing these things <laughs> and behaving in ways that you don't want it to behave. And um, we have glimpses of peace, of understanding when we see the nature of nature and then the inspired culture that arises in the mind of, of peace, of contentment of spaciousness, of acceptance. And yet, you know, so much of our practice life is sort of in this in-between period where perhaps before we were living mostly in delusion and at some point we'll be entirely free from it. But there's a, a long slog in between where we have to watch ourselves keep doing it <laughs> over and over. And it's like, oh my gosh. And of course, you know, it's like, it's, you, it's that hard acceptance of it's not just a matter of willpower. It's not just a matter of saying, I no longer want to do this. I will now do this. There's something about that. There's some, there, there are important places of discipline and determination and effort, right? As in, the Eightfold Path, these places that are very important, where our volitional intention and our energy toward things matters. But ultimately, it's a matter of observation and of wisdom, of seeing, and that there are still things we don't see clearly, right? Still patterns we don't see clearly, dynamics we're not seeing clearly, things that we don't understand things we maybe don't care about yet. We don't have the heart space to feel their worthiness of being attended to with patience, kindness, investigation. Places that we ignore or places in our own hearts that we're still hardened to, we don't have a relationship with yet. And to the degree that that's true, the mind will continue to be involved in its ramblings. And there are, of course, these disciplines, which is a a word that's very intense sometimes, and but determinations or um, aspirations that we do live into that that also help us build a, a culture in the mind that is more open, right? Where it's also not just we're not just, and this is where the no self piece comes in as a very helpful tool and tactic and method is. We may think, oh, we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of relationship with our own fear, and we have a lot of relationship with our anger, and we're we're working on these things. But when someone else is angry, someone else is ignorant, someone else says something abusive, uh, or behaves in a way that we think is repugnant, well, we have externalized that experience, right, as a them, as a as an other and ourselves as superior and not subject to those things. But it is essential to the practice to undermine that sense of self and other to the degree to which we just see ignorance and fear and anger and craving and greed and all of these behaviors that we may have such hard judgments of as worthy of investigation, worthy of care. And that's internally as much as externally. Wherever we have a block against it externally is just as important as a block internally in terms of where we still have development, where we still have learning, deepening in terms of what's possible for our relationship with any mind state, any action, wholesome or unwholesome. And so we do, we have these, you know, this idea of, of dana, of generosity, of, um, 
offering of our goodness, of material, of spiritual, of time, of the sense of where is our orientation in terms of generosity to the world around us, to other people in our lives, to people we encounter unexpectedly, to non-human beings, to the natural world that we come into direct contact with, to the unnatural world of plastics and metals and whatever. It's like, where are the limits? Where are the places in which our generosity of heart has not yet stretched, not yet reached, not yet blossomed? beautiful aspiration just to focus on generosity, of the generosity of kindness, right? Of patience with ourselves, patience with others. Of compassion, right? The feeling of loving kindness, but oriented towards pain, right? So the caring about pain in the world the, the hope that pain be alleviated for ourselves or others, the wishing well, the wanting of beings to be happy, the mudita, the appreciation for the joy in our lives or in the lives of others. Beautiful heart qualities that we can cultivate, mind culture that we cultivate and are responsible for all of the Brahma Viharas, all of the ethical discipline of, of seeing the harm and causing pain in hurting other beings in cruelty, right? Seeing the harm for ourselves and our own remorse and our own shame and what we have to live with when we've done something harmful. to ourselves or externally, you know, to others. This wanting to be a refuge for others, wanting people to feel safe around us, wanting to provide a sense of security and safety. Right? The sense of where do we start to trust love as a place of stability as much as greed? Right? Where do we start to trust compassion as a, a safety, as a stability, as a security for the heart, as much as anger. Where is equanimity experienced as a much deeper stability, a much deeper peace, a much deeper comfort than anything that could be provided to us through delusion, through ignoring, through fantasy. These take time, obviously. It takes a long time, but it's also entirely doable. It's, it's, an, it's a 100% a part of our practice, the cultivation of these beautiful qualities so that the, the mind, the heart, the body starts to trust these things, right? Trust these beautiful qualities of mind as much as, and then ultimately more than, the security that we're getting through ignorance, the security we're getting through aversion, the security we're getting through greed, craving. Because we are. We wouldn't be doing those things if we weren't getting something out of it, if we weren't creating some sense of stability and safety in those. So we have to appreciate that there's, there's something there. There's a reason why those still feel stronger at times why those might feel more secure, more dependable, more trustworthy than kindness, than love, than generosity. But we have to explore those things. We have to try to build the heart's capacity for those things in order for them to feel safer, more stable, more secure, more beautiful. What a beautiful home they create. What a beautiful culture.
and it is important, you know, also to see that there is, um, at its deepest level, the heart doesn't need to create safety from anything. The heart mind doesn't need to be creating security for itself or for others. So that there is of course something so beautiful about the cultivation of these qualities and, and essential. But it's also to be careful about seeing how identification with those things um, also can be a on a very subtle level still part of the anxiety for being that this place where nature meets culture right where the river of experience of dhammas meets what's being created and, and the culture of which is being created can be wholesome or unwholesome, that there is also a level of the practice at which the mind stops needing to create. That the mind doesn't need to turn anything into anything. It doesn't need to transform pain into love or uh, there's no magic needed. There's no conjuring, there's no fabrication that the stream of experience can actually come to an end. Right, so it's this possibility of equanimity with the nature and the formations of natural arisings is so powerful, right? It is this sense of this flow, right? Where everything is arising and passing on its own there is incredible peace in the mind that doesn't need things to be one way or the other. Mm, it's very beautiful, this equanimity. No need to manipulate, no need to conjure, letting the sort of stream of experience arise and pass on its own. But it's not to say that this practice of bhavana is just going back to nature that it's just letting nature be it, what it is, or only that we come to peace with birth, life, and death. Of course we do. That is essential. <laughs> it's, it's, it's such a powerful part of this. But also to understand there is something deeper than birth, life, and death. That from this place of deep, deep equanimity, where even there we can see the mind is um, involved in the continuation of process that at its deepest place, the mind can stop conjuring, that phenomena can come to an end and not need to be recreated. There's no anxiety, no compulsion towards being or becoming. No need to construct a new self, no need to construct a next moment or a future. In the Dhammapada, the Buddha says, through the round of many births I roamed without reward, without rest, seeking the house builder. Painful is birth again and again. House builder, you are seen. You will not build a house again. Your rafters broken, the ridge pole destroyed gone to the unformed, the mind has come to the end of craving. The sense of what is happening at these deepest levels, the most subtle levels of existence and of experience, where we can see this house builder, <laughs> not unethical, not like murderous rage or, you know, like nothing gross like that. It's like this very subtle level, a 
of this compulsion to become, right? Of whatever is happening, of, of enough little clinging toward it, enough grasping to it, enough running from it, that there's just a next, it leads to a next moment, right? It's that the momentum, the gravity, the force that compels the next thing to arise. And that the mind can see that. The mind has the ability to see that house builder. And then it stops. It stops building a house. The sense of your rafters are broken, your ridge pole collapsed. Come to the unconditioned. The mind has reached the end of craving. Something very beautiful, powerful. and possible. Part of it seen through another lens of um, the story of Bahia. Of, I won't tell the whole story here, but of a an earnest and confused mendicant who encountered the Buddha and just so truly wanted to be free that he kind of um, was almost, you'd say, impatient with trying to get some Dhamma teaching and kind of bothered the Buddha in the middle of his um, alms rounds. And finally, after his third request, the Buddha stopped to give him a very short teaching. He said, Bahia, you should train yourself thus. In the seen will merely be what is seen. In the heard will merely be what is heard. In the sensed will merely be what is sensed. In the cognized will merely be what is cognized. In this way, you should train yourself, Bahia. When Bahia, for you, in the seen is merely what is seen. In the cognized is what is merely cognized. And the heard was merely heard, and the sense merely sensed. Then, Bahia, you will not be with that. When, Bahia, you are not with that, you will not be in that. And when, Bahia, you are not in that, you will neither be here nor beyond nor in between the two. This, just this, is the end of suffering. So when you see these streams of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, mind, body, all of these phenomena flowing, you see them all as these independent streams being propelled by conditions. There's an understanding that there is no self in there. There's no self with it. There's no self beyond it. There's no self between it, right? That this notion of a coherent me is nowhere to be seen, nowhere to be experienced directly. It's the effect of craving. It's the effect of ignorance. It's the effect of the mind feeling so insecure in this vulnerability of life, of being, that it's finding its deepest refuge, not just in craving and aversion and attachment in these sort of individual ways, but ultimately in the sense of me, in the sense of self. That is the deepest refuge that we try to construct, that we're always constructing, right? The sense of security, of solidity, of stability, of comfort, even when we don't like ourselves or even when we're unsure about who we are. It's this meanness that we conjure at the center of these unrelated streams that is the heart of our delusion and the product of our delusion. And so again, in this practice, the, the seeing of these things clearly unravels, unveils the truth. Not to say that we don't exist, but that we don't exist in the way that we tend to think we do. That existence is a process, not a solid state. And it's a process happening at this point between vulnerability and responsibility. 
between nature and culture, between dhammas and bhavana. And that we can put it down. It can, it can come to an end. And it is where we have some of these more destructive metaphors, right? The rafters coming down, the, you know, the uh, ridge pole destroyed, or you know, um, chopping down the tree of ignorance. Even Srinivasa Maharaj, who Michelle likes to quote a lot, he has a quote saying something to the effect of, "In the spiritual life, there can never be too much destruction." Not always how we like to think of our happy little spiritual practice. What do we let fall away and fall apart without rebuilding? This body, this mind. It doesn't mean we don't care for them. We don't care about them, we don't tend to them, we don't take care of them. No, in fact, it's only through the deepest wisdom that we have the ability to care purely, care without expectation, without attachment, or expectation of outcome. And care for ourselves and others knowing that we'll die, that there will be loss, pain, hardship. And I think I want to just say a little bit about the conditions that support it and how much responsibility we do have for ourselves our own heart and mind culture, but also the broader culture right now in terms of Dhamma culture in contemporary times, no matter where you live, and maybe beyond that as well. When we go to Burma every year, except last year and don't expect to go this year. And there's of course some real pain about the undependability of that future for the, the country itself and for our relationships to the people and to the place right now. One of the things about where we go that's so powerful in the Sagang Hills is just how much refuge there is there. This area and, you know, outside of the city on the Irrawaddy River, where it's just miles and miles and miles of, of hills and then entirely covered in forest and monasteries and nunneries and and not just big ones, but little one room monasteries and nunneries and a little, you know, tons of just caves, maybe that are taken care of by some folks in the village or taken care of by a certain monastery. There's just so many places you, you, I mean, it would be hard to walk 50 feet without finding a new place that you could go and be quiet and feel safe and where there's an altar and that you've known there have been people practicing there for a thousand years. Hard to find a little cave in which someone probably didn't get fully enlightened at some point. And that like the vibe is still there, right? This, it's like the opposite of a nuclear reactor. And just how amazing that is, how totally precious and rare and wonderful 
with no charge, no fees, you know, guarantee you're going to leave with more than you've, you're able to offer, you know, you'll end up with tons of snacks and bananas and oranges and books and given to you, you know, by monks and nuns and lay people taking care of these places and good Dhamma. Now there are all kinds of complexities around living in a place where there's any dominant religion and it's, you know, another conversation, but it is important to recognize that how not apparent that kind of easily accessible refuge is in most of the places that I see people living in right now in this Zoom meeting. Right, the sense that you could walk out your door and feel safe being quiet and closing your eyes and doing walking meditation or doing sitting meditation or making an offering to an altar, you know, where's the closest place outside of your door that you can do that? And so much of what we've been trying to encourage during this period of practice and all this year and a half now or more since you know, COVID began and teaching online is like, how can people learn to create refuge and safety and sanctuary in their own lives, in your own homes, in your schedule, right? So it's a, a question of space. It's a question of time. Where in public, where in private. And there's all kinds of not that helpful things maybe to think about in terms of the future of a, what would a, a Buddhist culture in the West or in these Western countries or in, you know, in, even in modern Asian countries and across even in Burma and Thailand where things have changed so much in terms of development. And where, where are these places of refuge? Where is the heart space culturally? And so I think that piece of going, you know, out from here in terms of our practice, in terms of um, trying to develop the ability and the tools to observe these places of, of where, you know, nature meets culture, um, where vulnerability meets responsibility, where the dhammas meet our bhavana, this, like, the sanctity of these places, the sanctity of that moment in time that we try to live in and try to practice in and try to build these beautiful things, that there are material elements of that, but there's heart elements of that. And that it's like this qualities of spiritual friendship are so important. And where are we being good spiritual friends to one another? Where are we offering, where are we a refuge to another person? whether they're a practitioner or not, right? Where are we bringing whatever space we've cultivated, whatever wisdom, whatever capacity for patience or kindness, um, or the ability to hold anger and hold fear and, and hold tension with ourselves and with others? Are we sharing that in the world, right? With the people in our lives, which often of course can be very hard. You know, I like, don't wanna pretend like it isn't. But if we don't have a little cave, you know, every 50 feet for ourselves of other people to go practice in and to find refuge in, where is it that our own hearts, our own minds, our own practice might be a refuge for, for others, for other people, for those we care about? It's a big part of our responsibility and our need. You know, the there's of course very famous quote that I'll probably misquote from the Buddha of Ram, you know, Ananda asks, says, oh, I, you know, I think spiritual friendship is, must be half of the holy life. It's so great, you know, and the Buddha saying, no, don't say that, Ananda. Spiritual friendship is the whole, the entirety of the holy life. 
part of the miracle of the Buddha is believe that he did this on his own, right? That's considered like, it's so inconceivably impossible, right? That's probably why he's like so elevated, right? In the sense of that for it means that like we can't do it alone, you know, no matter how much we long for the independence and want to be free from conditions and all the drama and our families and lives. And it's like, the truth is, is we need this spiritual friendship. We need this connection. We need the community. We need the support. And it's not just any friendship. That's the part of around those quotes that most people don't like to listen to or don't really like. It's just like, it's, it's friendships that are based on and develop seclusion, dispassion, release, right? I think there's another... Seclusion, dispassion, cessation, release. How many friendships are building those, really? Even your spiritual friendships. Seclusion, dispassion, cessation, release. Very rare. But something that we have a taste for, the value of, and therefore can offer to other people. And I say it in kind of rejoicing that you are doing it, you know, even today to see so many people joining for the Sunday sitting and people who have been on the retreat for the weekend and people who've come for the weeks or the many weeks or the one week or whatever who are going on this next following week. There's something about just showing up, you know, in such a regular way that people have been doing. It's so beautiful. You know, most of you probably haven't shared a single word with one another on these Zooms, you know, that you've been coming to for so long. And maybe many of you know each other from a retreat here and there, or, you know, of course you're part of different sanghas where you may know one another in different ways. But to see how actually something gets supported around seclusion, dispassion, cessation, release. Outside of that, the showing up, the caring, the patience, the, the sharing of the space, the sharing of this commitment, how beautiful that is. So I hope you feel good about that and your own contribution to the Sangha, contribution to supporting one another. And of course, I know people recognize that you're receiving it from one another and that you're grateful and that it's so helpful when you're in the midst of slogging it out with some, you know, thing in our minds, our hearts, our bodies. And you come back and you see these friends here, these Dhamma friends, this Dhamma family, how good it is, how beautiful it is, how wholesome that you're a part of that. So thank you. Mm. And take good care. Oh yeah, Michelle, you can ring your, let's see. <laughs> Gotta ring a bell. <laughs> hmm. so thank you all for coming um for those for the sunday sitting folks next weekend i think we'll have a regular sunday sitting back again where we'll sit with instructions and have a short talk and some time for questions and for those who are finishing the retreat with us we have a uh, metta chanting and metta sitting happy hour at 3.30. <laughs> and we'll see you there. Take good care.